is from Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. In this gospel lesson, Jesus tells his disciples that the life to which they are called is not easy. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, for it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you, you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Well, it's wonderful to be here today. Great to see so many good friends. And the theme for today is about how the Olympics can teach the church something. Well, beginning, you know, early in the week, I sent Caleb my uh, scripture and uh, my sermon title. And this was largely because Carol and I had been hanging out in the evenings, I'm on sabbatical, uh, and watching the Olympics. And I absolutely love the Olympics, and we especially love the figure skaters. And there have been all kinds of stories about figure skating and, you know, who can kind of make it. And uh, there was a young woman from Italy who had had troubles in the past, and she ended up doing really great. And there was a young woman who we all know from Russia who uh, had had troubles and then she skated two perfect programs and ended up getting the goal. And it's great stuff, you know, you, you just love it. But then, after sending that, I got this incredible news. Horrific story about Haley Owens. How in the world could this happen in our community? How could this happen to a 10-year-old girl? simply walking home from her friend's house late in the afternoon with people on the street just sitting out as they usually do. And a person who normally, for what some of the articles suggested, was a nice guy who was considered by one young man interviewed not only as a nice person but as his mentor the individual who had been his coach, I think, in football, and it helped him to kind of come into his own. How can this person all of a sudden become an absolute villain and do something so utterly horrific? So here we have these two kinds of experiences. You know, the experience of joy as we're partaking in this international global family Olympics, and then all of a sudden, this horrific tragedy and the ending to a beautiful, young, vibrant life, the life of a child. And as I was thinking about it, I was reminded of my days in Chicago. And I remembered when I was a grad student there in the 70s, the early 80s, I would open up the Chicago Trib and the Sun-Times every morning, the two papers, and almost without fail, there would be one to two murders. And this weekend, I got my grad school magazine. And there's a new um, gentleman who is the head of the Chapin House, which is a family research 
uh, Institute at the University of Chicago. And he was in a leadership position in Chicago Public Schools. And the reason he took the job was because he said between 2007 and 2009, 550 children in the Chicago public schools were killed. Two years. And all of a sudden, I realized, for us, it is an extraordinarily rare occasion to see such horror. For other people in larger cities, it is what they experience on a daily basis. Alex Kokowitz wrote a very, very famous book called There Are No Children Here. And it was about his study of the high-rise projects for the poor on the north side of Chicago, the northwest side, Cabrini Green. What he discovered was that the mothers in Cabrini Green, who were all on welfare and utter poverty, always set aside enough money for a burial insurance policy for their children. Because in Cabrini Green, it was very, very likely that those children would not be able to grow up. And in the Robert Taylor homes, three miles from where I went to school, in one year, and I think it was the late 70s, 75 children died in a one mile area, one square mile area from gun violence. And in the church that is just a half a block around the corner from Disciples Divinity House, one of our denominational centers, they have on the front of the church banners listing the names of all of the children who have been killed from gun violence. And they have vigils on a regular basis for those children. This is not the world that we want. This is not what is supposed to be. And when we hear the scriptures for today, it seems so removed. What does it mean to be a new creation? Everything is new when such devastation is occurring all around us. And what does it mean to have a silly debate with James and John? Can we be first? Can we be on top? When so many people are not. As I was thinking about all of this challenge, I, like everyone else, felt incredible sympathy for the child, for the family, for the community. And I asked myself, so what, what can we do? And as I thought about it, I realized that those Olympics that are going on in Sochi, in Russia, may actually have some lessons to teach us, even here, even now, in our situation. And the first thing that came to my mind was the reality the very miracle that we all do get together for the Olympics. Because there's political conflict everywhere. There are people who are engaged in wars, nations against nations, and they still all come to the Olympics. And I thought, this is a lesson, that it's at the center of the disciples' tradition that we are meant to be one and that nothing should really pull us apart. And when there is crisis and division, and when something horrible happens, we often immediately run to blame. For instance, in this last week, I have heard blaming of the Springfield Public School System for pulling the D.A.R.E. program and cutting the funding. Because one of the lessons of the D.A.R.E. program, in addition to not using drugs, is the lesson to not interact with strangers, to stay away from strangers. And I've heard people blaming the school system for the hiring 
of this individual in the first place. And I have seen some people batting down the hatches and trying to protect themselves and pulling away from community. And I pray we don't go in that direction. Over the last five years, we've had a huge economic downturn. Do you know why Springfield has been seen as doing better than many of the other cities around the country? It's because we have high social capital. We know one another. We interact with one another. We have a huge number of people participating in voluntary organizations. That's our genius. When trust goes down, our capacity to solve problems such as this, to protect children, goes down as well. Right now, there's an Every Child Counts program. The former president, Ed Hurry, Todd Parnell, and his wife, Betty, are the leaders. And they're working very hard to protect children. I hope that we will take this horrific experience and use it as a catalyst to, as a community, have a deeper commitment to the care for children so that all children will not only be safe, but have an opportunity for a meaningful future. The other lesson that I've taken from the Olympics is the importance of personal stories. It's not that exciting to see a bunch of strangers compete even though you know they've worked hard. It means something when you know the person. Well, here in Springfield, we, we certainly uh, have uh, heard uh, uh, of uh, Emily, uh, and I'm blanking on her last name, uh, help me. Scott. Scott, thank you, yeah, Emily Scott, um, and, uh, and Gracie Gold, of course. But what's amazing to me, I think, is the story of Emily Scott. Uh, growing up in relative poverty, uh, her father barely making ends meet, her mother currently in prison, having gotten hooked onto methamphetamines and selling them. And then when she was about to just go on to food stamps to be able to survive, uh, crowdsourcing through the internet, and then uh, 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 a news station picked that up, and then over, uh, I think, a week, she got $48,000 so that she was able to train, and then that she was able to get her dad to come to so she had never, never been out of the country. I think that there are Emily Scotts all over Springfield who also have personal stories of challenge, who are also trying to make it. They don't have the extraordinary gift of being a world-class speed skater, but they do have gifts. And my prayer for us is that if we hear that passage of Mark seriously, James and John, you know, the C-minus followers of Jesus Christ, <laughs> if we can kind of get the message that it's not about being on top, but it's about being the greatest servant, then we can help those personal stories come alive in ways that are ultimately life-giving. And the last lesson that I take from the Olympics is the lesson of virtue. We often think the Olympics is about victory. Who's on top? Who gets the gold? Who gets the silver? Who gets the bronze? But if you've ever noticed, when these people are competing and then the three win, what typically happens? Other people who didn't win go over and hug them and celebrate with them and lift them up. And that tells me something very important. They get it. It's not about that gold medal. It's not about medals. It's about a community of people who have committed themselves to a set of habits that are life-giving and transformative and make them champions. And I'm absolutely convinced that this may be the very best way to think of the Christian life. Not in terms of following a set of rules, not in terms of achieving some kind of great goal, but the normal habits of allowing ourselves to be conformed to the way of Jesus. That is life-giving. And to be conformed with the kind of passion and the kind of discipline that we see among our athletes 
some of whom get to go to the Olympics. What might it be to be an Olympic Christian? What might it be to be an Olympic church? Well, I already said, I think you got an Olympic clock. And I think you got an Olympic associate pastor. And I think you got some Olympic people who are in this very room right now. And I can't help but think of Claire Bess Eichner, whose 95th birthday celebration ran throughout the month of January, <laughs> as one of those Olympic people. And I happen to be wearing Alan Stoll at this very moment. The Eichners completely giving their lives to this community at Drury here in the Wyoming Church. A beautiful, beautiful thing. And I see Cindy Summers over there. And Cindy, I understand you've been doing a fabulous job with the children's program. And that is a very, very great thing. And I see Kenny Keitlinger uh, back in the back row. And uh, I understand that Kenny has quietly had his hands in all over this church in terms of all kinds of activities. This Campbell Summer Club I have heard about, and I think you're also a deacon in addition to being in the choir. And somebody said to me, now Kenny Keitlinger, whenever we have a meal, he always stays to clean up. Well, these are a big, big deal. These are transformations that really matter. And Juanita Matthews, who just got, I understand, the Lifetime Award for all of her work with Crossroads, which is an, an enormous statement of years and years of contribution to the community, which really transforms. And John Barber back there with the sound system and the Hoffmans, I understand, working with outreach and safety and security and it goes on and on. You are the Olympic Church in a world that needs Olympic Christians. And at this time, as we think about Haley and Owens, I pray that we will not break apart and pull away, but that we will be connected together as one. That we will not simply talk about people facing tragedy as statistics and numbers, but instead we'll see them as real life individuals with real stories that we can have a positive impact on. And lastly, I pray that we will follow the path of virtue, allowing ourselves to be formed by the way of Jesus. May God's blessings be with the Owens family. May God's blessings be with the immediate community around them in a time of crisis. May God's blessings be with this church, with its special ministries for this time and this place. May God's blessings indeed be with the whole world in Sochi and everywhere else.